Hello, everyone. My name is Kayvon Kamali. I'm going to be uh, presenting uh, image classification um, in Galaxy uh, with Food360 dataset. Uh, just so you know, I'm a member of the Galaxy team at Penn State University. So uh, this tutorial uh, basically has two sections. Uh, first, uh, I'll go over some slides to discuss uh, uh, convolutional neural networks. That's the model that we're going to use for image classification. I will then uh, briefly talk about the Food360 data set. And afterwards, uh, we're going to move to uh, usegalaxy.org, and we're going to actually implement the neural network. We're going to train it, evaluate it, and visualize the results. So just so you know, um, the uh, Galaxy Training Network website uh, which is uh, training.galaxyproject.org. Uh, this website has all the tutorials Galaxy related. Under the topics, you can scroll down to uh, statistics and uh, machine learning. And uh, if you scroll down further, you would see image classification Galaxy uh, with Fruit 360 data set. These are the slides, this link. These are, this is the tutorial, uh, the data set, and the workflow. So, um, so sorry. Uh, so let's go over the slides. Um, they're right here. Okay, the requirements, you, you need to be familiar with uh, Galaxy platform. Introduction to Galaxy analysis would be a good tutorial. Also, it would be a good idea to complete deep learning part three, convolutional neural networks or CNNs. Uh, regardless, we're gonna cover uh, both of those tutorials roughly in this tutorial. The introduction to Galaxy analysis basically teaches you how to upload a file, run a tool, and uh, see the outcome. We're gonna do that here anyway, and we're gonna cover a big chunk of uh, the deep learning uh, part three in this tutorial as well. So the questions that we want to answer is how to solve an image classification problem using convolutional neural networks. And the objectives are learn how to create a convolutional neural network or CNN as they're called using Galaxy's deep learning tools and solve an image classification problem on Fruit360 data set using CNN in Galaxy. So what is a convolutional neural network? So there are different types of neural networks. Uh, roughly, you can break them into three types. Uh, Feed-forward neural networks are the classical, if you will, neural networks that don't have any loops in them. Uh, they've been used for many classification, uh, regression, uh, optimization uh, problems. Uh, we have recurrent neural networks that uh, deal with uh, time series data, whether it's the temporal data or ordinal data. And we also have convolutional neural networks that are specifically tailored for image processing. So convolutional neural networks, uh, there has been an increased uh, popularity of social media in the past decade or so. And this has made image and video processing tasks very important. Feed forward neural networks or FNNs uh, could not scale up to image and video processing tasks and uh, convolutional neural networks or CNNs are specifically tailored for image and video processing tasks. Hence, we're gonna be using them. So inspiration for convolutional neural networks. In uh, 1959, Hubble and Weisel did an experiment to understand how the visual cortex of the brain processes visual information. They recorded the activity of neurons in the visual cortex of a cat while moving a bright line in front of the cat. So some cells in the visual cortex fired when the bright line was shown at a particular angle and location. So they called these cells simple cells. Other cells fired when bright line was shown regardless of the angle and location. They seem to detect movement and uh, these, they call these cells complex cells. And it seemed like complex cells receives, receive input from multiple simple cells and they have a hierarchical structure. Uh, Hubble and Weisel won the uh, Nobel Prize in 1981 for their uh, groundbreaking research. <clears throat> so uh, inspired by complex and simple cells, uh, Fukushima proposed Neocognitron. It's a hierarchical neural network used for handwritten Japanese character recognition. It's the first convolutional neural network and it had, and had its own proprietary training algorithm. In 1989, Lacun proposed uh, 
a convolutional neural network that could be trained by backpropagation. So backpropagation, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is a standard neural network training algorithm. It is used for, for training feed-forward neural networks, the classical neural networks, recurrent neural networks, neural networks that handle time series. And now, um, with this research, it could be used to uh, uh, train convolutional neural networks as well. And uh, convolutional neural networks became very popular when they outperform other models in ImageNet Challenge. So ImageNet Challenge is a challenge that's been run annually since, annually since 2010 to present. And uh, it's uh, optic classification and detection on hundreds of categories and millions of images. So notable uh, convolutional neural network architectures that won the ImageNet Challenge are AlexNet in 2012, that basically started the convolutional neural network craze. ZFNet 2013, Google Net and VGG 2014, and ResNet in 2015. So here we're going to talk about the architecture of convolutional neural networks. Uh, a CNN typically has four layers. There's an input layer, convolution layer, pooling layer, and fully connected layer. And we will explain uh, a 2D convolutional neural network here, but the same concept applies to 1D or 3D convolutional neural network. So what does one, two, and three D convolutional neural network means? Uh, it's basically well, we have to go to the next slide to understand what a filter is. But it's uh, the number of dimensions that we move the filter in. If you move the filter in one dimension, that's one dimensional convolutional neural network. If you move it in two dimensions, that's two D. If you move it in three dimensions, that's three D. So we're going to get to what a filter is in a little bit. So input layer, uh, for example. Uh, we could have a 28 pixel by 28 pixel grayscale image. And uh, we don't need to, uh, in a traditional neural network, feed forward neural network, we would usually flatten this into a vector. Um, in convolutional neural network, we don't have to do that. We can present the image as is, which is a matrix of 28 by 28. Uh, this makes capturing spatial relationships easier uh, for the neural network. So convolution layer is composed of multiple filters, as we discussed, or they're also called kernels. And the filters for a 2D image, they're also two-dimensional. And suppose we have a three by three uh, filter. Uh, it's basically nine values. Uh, values are randomly set to values between zero and one, or sometimes minus one and one. And uh, convolution is like pl placing a three by three filter on the top left corner of an image, say it's a 28 by 28 image, and multiplying filter values by pixel values and adding up the results, uh, moving filter to the right one pixel at a time and repeating this process. When we get to the uh, rightmost uh, pixel, um, we move down one filter and start, start from the left-hand side again. And this whole process is repeated until we get to the bottom right corner of the image. That's when we stop. So this could be uh, visualized a lot easier, uh, what I just explained. So let's say you have a four by four image. It's a, a light blue uh, uh, image up at the bottom. And let's say you have a three by three filter. It's the dark blue uh, uh, square that you can see. So um, the dark blue is on the top left now. And the filter values and pixel values, image pixel values are multiplied and added and they result in one value in the output, which is the green um, square at, uh, at the top. So we move to the right, then we move down, and again to the right. And this is on the loop, so you can see it multiple times. So as you can see, um, we applied the filter to the image, and we got an output, which is shown in green. So convolution operator has uh, multiple parameters, filter size, padding, stride, dilation, and activation function. We're going to go over uh, each of them one by one. So filter size can be 5 by 5, 3 by 3, and so on. Larger filter sizes should be avoided because uh, we need the learning algorithm for neural network needs to learn the value of uh, or weights in the filter. And the more values that we have, the more difficult it is to uh, the learning process becomes. Also, odd size filters are preferred to even size filters. They have some nice geometric, geometric properties in that all input pixels are around the output pixel. You can't say that for uh, even shaped uh, filters. 
uh, padding. So you saw that uh, we applied a three by three filter to a four by four image and we got a two by two image. The size of the image has gone down. That was right here. So a three by three filter applied to a four by four image resulted in a two by two image as the output. So if you want to keep the image size the same, we use padding. So what does it mean? It means we pad the input in every direction with zeros before applying the filter. So if the padding is one by one, then we add one zeros in every direction. If the padding is two by two, we add two zeros in every direction and so on. So here's an example of padding. We have a five by five image. That's a light blue in the bottom, light blue square in the bottom. We have a one by one padding. So we add uh, zeros, one zero in every direction. And then we apply a three by three filter. So we apply it to the image plus the padding, as you can see. And this results in a five by five output image. So the size of the input image and the size of the output image are the same. So that's the, what padding does. The other parameter of convolutional neural network is stride. So how many pixels do we move the filter to the right or down is stride. If you move the filter one pixel to the right or down, it's a stride of one. If you move the filter two pixels to the right and down, it's a stride of two and so on. So here, actually, let me go back to the previous example. If you look here, we move the filter one to the right and one to the one in the downward direction. But it doesn't have to be one, it could be two. And here's one example. So we move the filter, the dark blue square at the bottom, two to the right and two in the downward direction. So that's a stride of two. And the effect of a stride of two is the uh, output image is smaller now. So that's another parameter. Another parameter is dilation. So when we apply a three by three filter, the output is affected by pixels and a three by three subset of the image. Dilation is to have a larger receptive field. What that means is portion of the image that affects the filter's output. So if we set the dilation to two, instead of a contiguous three by three subset of the image, every other pixel of a five by five subset of the image affects the output. So what does that mean? Let's take a look. So we have a three by three filter. That means our uh, uh, filter has nine values. But the dilation is two. So instead of these nine values being contiguous, they are um, every other value of a five by five square at the bottom. As you can see, uh, it starts from uh, top left right now, moves to the right, and then one down, again to the right, and then one down. So this increases the receptive field, the part of the input image that affects the output for us, if that's what we desire. Um, there's also an activation function. So after the filter is applied to the image, we use an activation function to introduce nonlinearity. So the idea is that we want to solve nonlinear problems with the neural networks. And uh, this is our way of introducing nonlinearity. So the preferred activation function for convolutional neural network is ReLU, uh, rectified linear unit, if I'm not mistaken. And ReLU leaves outputs with positive values as is, replaces negative values with zero. So here's one example. So let's say our output uh, is on the left-hand side. And those are the values. Some are zero, some are positive, some are negative. After we apply the activation function, the negative values on the left are replaced with zero. Zero and positive values are left as they are. So uh, this is an example of a single channel uh, 2D convolution. So we have a five by five image and you see the value of the pixels uh, in the image on the left hand side. And we have a filter, uh, which is three by three and it has nine weights and each weight has a value is initialized to some value. And what we do is that we place that three by three filter on the top left corner of the image and we multiply uh, filter values by image pixel values accordingly, and we add them up. And the calculation is uh, shown down here. And we have one value, which is five. And then we move filter to the right and repeat, and that gives us the output image. So this is a grayscale image in that uh, every pixel is represented by one value. So usually, um, uh, 
think uh, Z, it's a, between Z, the value of pixels could be between zero and 255, where I think zero is black, 255 is white, and anything in between are different shades of gray. So uh, a grayscale image. But if the image is a color image, then we use, uh, we mix three primary colors, red, green, and blue with different uh, portions to uh, create, represent every image. So every pixel is represented by three values. And to uh, basically present a 3D um, image, we're going to like uh, uh, show you three two-dimensional images here. So for example, channel one, these are the values for the red uh, uh, channel. Uh, channel two is uh, green, and channel three is uh, blue. So it's RGB. And we have three filters. And these filters are applied let's say to the top left corner accordingly, similar to the previous example, and we get three values. So the difference is now we add these three values and we have a single value for the output. So we, when you apply a filter, the channel size becomes one. So we had a image that had, uh, was in, uh, it was a color image and was represented by uh, three values. The output image is represented by one value. So this is the same thing, only in three dimensional. So you have an image on the left-hand side. You have a filter in the middle. This filter is being applied to the image, and the filter moves from top left to the right, and then it goes down and repeats, and goes down and repeats, and we have the output on the right-hand side. So, um, so as I mentioned, the output of a multi-channel 2D filter is a single-channel 2D image. That's the example that we gave here. On the left-hand side, we have an image uh, which is uh, color and it has uh, every pixel has three values. Hence, we say it has a channel size of three. But after these three filters were applied, the values were added up, we have one value. So, uh, if we apply multiple filters, uh, this results in multi channel to the image. So, for example, if image was 28 by 28 by three rows, number of rows, number of calls, number of channels. And we apply a three by three filter with one by one padding, we get a 28 by 28 by one image. But if we have 15 such filters, our output would be 28 by 28 by 15. So we can use the number of filters to increase or decrease the channel size in the output. So here with uh, one filter, the channel, uh, the channel size of output is one. But if you have 15 filters, repeat this process 15 times, we would have 15 values in the output or we could lower the number of filters if needed, increase or decrease. So after the convolution layer, so we have the input layer, the convolution layer, and now we have a pooling layer. Pooling layer performs downsampling to reduce special dimensionality of the input, very simple. So this decreases the number of parameters, reduces learning time and learning computation, and reduces the likelihood of overfitting. Overfitting is when the learning process learns the training data really well, but cannot generalize to any other data, which should, which should be avoided. So most popular type of pooling is max pooling. It's usually a two by two filter with a stride of two, returns the maximum value as it uh, slides over the input data. So finally, we have a fully connected layer. It's the last layer in convolutional neural network connects all the nodes from the previous layer to this fully connected layer when it is responsible for classifying the image. So this is an example of a convolutional neural network. On the left-hand side, this is the image of a digit that we want to uh, classify. This is like handwritten digit zero. So we have a convolution layer, uh, many filters, followed by a pooling layer. And we can have multiple convolution plus pooling layers in our convolutional neural network. In this case, we have three, as you can see. So we have convolution with activation function ReLU followed by pooling. We have another convolution with activation function ReLU followed by pooling. And we have a third convolution uh, layer with ReLU followed by pooling. You could have four, five, 10, depending on how complex the problem you're trying to solve. Same thing for the number of filters in each layer. It could be 16, 32, uh, 64, 128, and so on. Eventually, you get to a fully connected layer. And then we have an output layer that, because we're classifying images, we want to have 10 outputs in our output layer, which represent images 0 to 9. 
So uh, an example CNN, uh, <clears throat> a typical CNN, as we discussed, has several convolution plus pooling layers. And each of those is responsible for feature extraction at different levels of abstraction. So for example, filters in the first layer could detect horizontal, vertical, and diagonal edges. Filters in the second layer can detect uh, shapes, which is a collection of edges. And filters in the third layer could detect collection of shapes. So that's uh, uh, that's how uh, convolutional neural networks do uh, feature extraction. So filter values are randomly initialized. They're learned by the learning algorithm. Uh, CNN not only do, does classification, but can also do automatically automatically do feature extraction, which is very important. This is something that distinguishes CNN from other classification techniques like support vector machines and makes it very, very powerful. Okay, so uh, we discussed what convolutional neural networks are. Now let's talk about the data set that we're going to use for image classification a little bit. So we're using Fruit 360 data set. It's a data set of 90,380 images of 131 fruits and vegetables. Images are 100 pixel by 100 pixel and are color images, RGB, red, green, blue. So each pixel has three values. Uh, 67,000 images are used for training and 22,000 images are used for testing. And this is a link to uh, where you can download the data set. For this tutorial, we only use a subset of the Fruit360 data set. And the subset contains only 10 fruits and vegetables. We selected a subset of images, so the data set is smaller and the CNN can be trained faster during this tutorial. Otherwise, we have to wait hours for, well, maybe an hour or more for the 90,000 uh, training data set, 67,000 uh, training images to train the data set, to train the neural network. So the subset data set has 5,000 images in training and 1,600 images in testing data sets. So I created a, um, a GitHub repository called Fruit Dataset Utilities. This is, these are the scripts uh, for creating a subset of Fruit 360 data set. Uh, first, I uh, create a feature vector for each image. Uh, second, we select a subset of 10 fruits and vegetables. And the training test data set sizes went from seven gigabytes and two and a half gigabytes to 500 megabytes and 177 megabytes. So that's a sizable reduction in data set size. Third, we created separate files for feature vectors and labels. And finally, we map the labels for the 10 selected fruits and vegetables to a range of zero to nine. Because the initial data set, uh, the original data set has 131 fruits and vegetables. The labels are in the range of one to one, zero to 130. That's not what we want when we're only classifying 10 of them. So they need to be remapped. Um, the images are 100 pixel by 100 pixel uh, color RGB. So the image can be represented by 100 by 100 by three values, which is 30,000 values. So let's say you want to create another subset of this data set and you want uh, 30 fruits and vegetables to be included. You can just use the scripts in this uh, GitHub repository, follow instructions and you can create your own data set. Um, so next we're gonna define a CNN and uh, we're gonna train it uh, with a Fruit360 data set. And uh, the goal is to learn a model uh, such that uh, when you give it an image of a fruit or vegetable, we can predict what it is. The neural network will spit out a number between zero and nine. And each of those numbers represent a fruit. For example, zero could be strawberry. Uh, we then evaluate the trained uh, CNN on a test data set. So what we do is uh, we use a training data set to train the model. And we've set aside some data as test data sets. So when the training is over, uh, we present the test data set to the model. Uh, we compare the predicted output with the actual output to see how good or bad our model is doing. And the way we evaluate um, uh, a model is by using a confusion matrix, which will explain uh, the hands-on section. So references, uh, please go to tutorials uh, reference section for all the references. I think uh, if you scroll down here, uh, these are all the references for this uh, presentation. Oops, sorry. So what else? 
this is training.galaxyproject.org is uh, Galaxy Trading Network's website. You can follow and find uh, any uh, all tutorials Galaxy related there. And if you need help, you can go to helpgalaxyproject.org or use one of the theater channels. And we also have uh, events, uh, which you can go to galaxyproject.org forward slash events to find. So uh, this concludes the, uh, uh, the, the slides for this presentation, for this tutorial. The next step would be to uh, uh, the hands-on section where we implement a neural network in Galaxy, which we'll get to shortly. Okay, uh, let's start the hands-on section of the tutorial. Share my screen. So uh, we go to uh, usegalaxy.org. And uh, if you go to Galaxy, we, we need to go to the tutorial itself. So if you go to um, uh, training.galaxyproject.org, uh, scroll down to statistics and machine learning on the topics and go to image classification in Galaxy with Food 360 data set and click on the tutorial. So we go to the, we covered the uh, uh, background uh, knowledge. Now we go to get data section. Okay, so I'm gonna switch between this tab and use Galaxy as I uh, implement uh, uh, the steps. So uh, the first step is make sure you have an empty analysis history. The way you do that is uh, by clicking on this uh, plus sign. So we have a new history. Uh, then rename, number two, rename history to make it easy to recognize. So you rename the history by clicking on this box that has unnamed history. And uh, it's a good idea to give it a meaningful name. So I'm gonna call it Food360. Uh, Let's go back to the tutorial. Uh, import the files from Xenoblock. So what you do is you copy these four links, go back to usegalaxy.org. On the top left corner, there's an upload data button. Click on that. Click on paste fetch data and paste the, uh, uh, the URLs here and click start and close this. So this starts four jobs to download these four files. Uh, two of them are training files. The other two are test files. Uh, the training files, uh, train X is the feature vector, train Y is the label. So these are the images. These are the label of the images, for example, strawberry, apple, etc. These two are used for training. These two are used for evaluating the trained model. So when the job starts, it's in a gray color, uh, which means it's queued. Then it becomes uh, yellowish, uh, means it's running. And when it goes to green, that means it's complete. If something fails, it's gonna go into red. Uh, we have to look and see what's going on. <clears throat> so uh, the next step is uh, after the file uh, download uh, upload is complete, we're gonna rename them. We basically drop the extension. And finally, we're gonna make sure that the uh, the data uh, type is tabular. So let's go here and uh, wait for this to uh, complete. Okay, so the file upload is complete. I paused the video just uh, so you don't have to wait for it. Now what we need to do is we have to rename the files and make sure they are of type tabular. So we click on this uh, edit attributes uh, button. Um, here's the name part and we get rid of the extension. And save it. And we go to data types and it's not of type interval, it's not of type tabular. So what you do is you type tabular here, select it and save it. So we're done with uh, train X10. We're gonna do the same thing for the other three files. Edit, 
remove the extension and save. Check data type, it is tabular, so we're good here. The third one. Of the extension, make sure it is tabular. Save. Let's see what else. Let's see what we want. Okay, it seems to initially it didn't work. I don't know why. Uh, so same thing here, get rid of the extension, it is tabular and save. So we did, what we did was that we renamed the files and we made sure that the type of all the files is tabular. If not, we converted it to be a tabular uh, file. Now let's go back to uh, the, uh, the tutorial. So we've completed the uh, get data part. Now, uh, we're going to go and basically implement uh, the new old uh, network. So um, one note here is basically this part. Uh, in order to train the convolutional neural network, we have to have the one hot encoding representation of the training variables. Uh, this is to uh, calculate the loss function. Basically, when uh, our, our neural network makes a prediction, we're gonna compare the prediction with the actual output, and we're gonna measure how much off is the neural network. In order to do that, the labels have to be in one hot code, one hot encoding representation. So what is one hot encoding representation? Uh, one hot, and OHE encodes labels as a one hot numeric array where only one element in the array is one, the rest are zero. So here's one example to clarify things. Let's say we had three fruits, apples, oranges, and bananas, and their labels were one, two, and three. Uh, the one hot encoding representation of uh, apple would be one and two zeros. The first element of a vector of size three is one. The one hot encoding representation of orange would be zero, one, zero. Uh, again, the second element in the array of size three would be one, and the one hot encoding representation of banana would be zero, zero, one. The third element of the uh, vector of size three would be one. So, uh, so we're gonna do the same thing for, uh, in, in our case, uh, we're dealing with 10 fruits and vegetables. So it's gonna be a vector of size 10, only one element in that vector would be one, everything else would be zero. And if it's label one, the first element would be one. If it's label five, the fifth element would be one and so on. So how we do that is uh, we use a tool. Um, so let's look at the train Y 10 data. You view the contents of a file by clicking on this eye icon. So this file has three columns, label name, file name, and label. So label name is basically a string representation of what this integer value represents. So we represent strawberry with zero, I don't know, apple with one, and so on. And this is just the file, the image file that has this label. So what we care about, we care about this third column only. And what we're going to do is that we're going to use advanced cut to only um, get the third column. So we don't need the first two. So uh, the way we do that is we're going to go into this uh, tools uh, search box and type advanced, oops, uh, typo, advanced cut. So I click on uh, show the section. So I know, uh, I know that this tool is under text manipulation. So, uh, so advanced cut, there's two, let's see if it's this one. I think it is, I think it's this one. So advanced cut uh, from a table, uh, cut to file, which is our train Y10. So we're gonna select that here. That's the file that I showed you, you have three columns. So we're gonna keep the uh, 
third column. So we're going to leave the operation as keep. We know that the file is tab limited and uh, we're going to keep the third column and we're going to execute. So this is going to create a file that's only the third column of train Y10. And if you look at train Y10, the third column is the labels only. So we should have the labels in this output of this tool. So then uh, after that, we're going to use a tool called two categorical. This basically calculates the one hot encoding of that um, integer value. So let's say we have a column uh, that has values zero to nine. Uh, the one hot encoding representation for each of those values, zero, one, all the way to nine is a vector of size 10 where all the values are zero except one of them. And the only one that's not zero depends on the label. So if the label is three, the third element is not zero. If it's seven, the seventh element is not zero and so on. So we do that with this two categorical tool. We saw that this cut command completed. If we view the contents, we should see only the label, great. So we go here and type two categorical. So we find it. So we pass the output of the cut operation, which is here, number five. Uh, does the data set contain header? Yes, it does. And how many classes do we have? So we have 10 fruits and vegetables, so this should be set to 10. And we're going to execute this. And this should give us uh, basically um, a vector of size 10 for every label. And we're going to view the uh, output when this completes. Okay, so while that's running, uh, we're going to start, we're going to start uh, developing the, creating the uh, uh, neural network. And that's done via a tool called Create a Deep Learning Model Architecture. So you could uh, try uh, typing it here in the search box, but I know that it is under the machine learning tools. So I'm just gonna scroll down. There's a statistics and visualization uh, header. Under that, we have statistics, machine learning, and graph, dis graph or display data. So if you expand the machine learning and you scroll down, uh, you see create a deep learning model architecture. So I'm gonna click on that, okay? And then we're gonna to go to the tutorial. We're gonna basically implement it just like the way it's specified here. So select Keras model type, it's sequential. Input shape is 30,000. It is sequential. We're gonna change this to 30,000. And then layer one, it's a reshape layer. Um, so each image, because it's an image of uh, 100 pixel by 100 pixel and it is RGB, which means each pixel is represented by three values. So each image is represented by 100 by 100 by three values, which is 30,000. So we're gonna reshape it. So it's a two dimensional image with a channel size of three. Uh, so reshape to 100, 100 and three. So here I'm gonna type reshape if I can. And I'm going to specify the target to be 100, 103. We're going to add another layer. So we're going to add a convolution, 2D convolutional layer with 16 filters, uh, kernel size 5, activation function ReLU, and input shape 100, 103. So let's go here. Uh, I'm going to type in conv2D. Uh, 16 filters, kernel size five, activation function, ReLU, and I'm just gonna copy this from here instead of typing it, six and nine. So this goes in the keyword argument section. And let's double check, it is uh, 16, five ReLU. 16.5, so that's good. So we're going to do another layer. So usually a convolution layer is followed by max pooling layer. And 
it's the case here too. We have a max pooling 2D when it's a pool size of two by two. So I'm just gonna type max pool 2D. It is two by two, I'll leave it as it is. Now we have another convolutional layer followed by a max pooling layer and maybe another convolutional layer followed by a max pooling layer. So we're just gonna enter those in. So let's see, we got the reshape layer, we got the convolutional layer, we got the max pooling layer. So we have another conf 2D, this is time the number of filters is 32. So, And a max, uh, max pool in 2D follows that. Okay, let's go back to the tutorial. So we implemented these layer four and five. Again, layer six and seven are again convolutional layer four and followed by max pool layer. A number of filters is 64 here. So I'm going to go here and type conf 2D. 64, kernel size is five, activation function is ReLU, ReLU and uh, this is max pooling 2D, go for the next layer. So let's go back to the uh, uh, tutorial. After the third convolution plus max pooling, we do a flatten. So we flatten, uh, basically connect all the, um, uh, nodes from the previous layer to a flat layer. So let's do that. I type flatten here, it finds it. And then we go, the next layer is a dense layer of 256 with the ReLU activation function. So this is already dense. We just say 256 for the number of units. And we select ReLU. And finally, we have a dense layer of size 10 with softmax activation function. Uh, this is size 10, Play, uh, select softmax. So what this does is that uh, basically we're gonna get a probability distribution for uh, 10 uh, nodes. And one of them uh, would be, would have the, whichever node has the largest probability, that's our prediction. So let's review this one more time. Um, we had a reshape layer. So the input is a vector of 30,000. We reshape it into 100 by 100 by three. The image is 100 by 100 pixel and it's a color image RGB. So channel size is three. Uh, then we have a convolutional layer followed by a max pooling layer repeated three times. The first time it has 16 filters. The second time it has 32 filters, the convolutional 2D. And the third time it has 64 filters. Then we flatten everything and connect it to a 256 uh, unit dense, full, dense layer. And then we have an output layer. It gets in, again, it's dense, it has 10 units and the activation function is softmax, which gives us a probability distribution over 10 possible labels. So we click on, execute, this creates the model. This model, when created, it can be downloaded as a JSON file. It's uh, readable. You can uh, see uh, what the model represents. So after that, we're going to, we need to specify the optimizer, the loss function, and some fit parameters. And that's done via create deep learning model. Again, because uh, you can search in the search box or uh, again, you can scroll down to uh, the machine learning section, expand it, and scroll down and find it. So this is create, deep, create a deep learning model with an optimizer, loss function, and fit parameters. So uh, the input is the output of the previous step, which is this job number seven. It is pre-populated in this uh, dropdown. So uh, let's look at the tutorial. We want a Keras G classifier. That's again set correctly. Um, the loss function is categorical cross entropy. So we're going to change this to categorical 
cross entropy. So cross entropy is a function that uh, objectively measures the difference between the desired output and the actual output. And because we have more than two labels, if we had only two labels, we would use binary cross entropy. But because we have 10 labels, we're going to use categorical cross entropy. As for the optimizer, this is uh, the optimizer uh, that minimizes uh, the, this loss function. And uh, we're going to select atom optimizer. Atom optimizer is preferred because uh, it has momentum and it also has uh, different learning rates for different dimensions. So those are the two advantages of uh, atom optimizer. And finally, the fit parameters, we pick epochs to be 40. So epochs is how many times do we use the training data set to train the model? When we set it to 40, that means we use the 5,000 training data sets set 40 times to train the model. And the final parameter is uh, batch size, which is 50. So um, we need to, uh, basically we present the training data to our neural network. Um, we uh, evaluate the output, and depending on how good or bad the neural network does, we update the parameters. And this is a loop. So we could update the parameters after all the 5,000 data sets, uh, the data points in the data sets are presented, or that's uh, probably going to take a long time. We could um, update the parameters after batch size uh, training data is presented to the neural network. So instead of uh, updating the uh, uh, neural network parameters after every 5,000 samples, we do it after 50. This is just to speed up the updates of weights so we can get to the local minimum uh, value for the loss function. And I think that's it. We can click, click execute here. And this will uh, build the, uh, uh, this is the Keras model builder. So let's go back to the tutorial. So now we're going to train the model. And that's done via deep learning training and evaluation. Again, in the machine learning section, I'm going to look for deep learning training and evaluation. It is right here. Let's go back to the tutorial. I select the scheme, train, and validate. That's already pre selected. Uh, choose the data set containing the estimator, pipeline estimator object. That's the output of our previous step, which is number job number eight right here. That's already pre-populated, that's good. Um, select input type, tabular data is pre-selected, good. And we're gonna train on train X10 data set. So let's select that. So we're gonna go here and select train X10. Um, we're gonna select all the columns in this file. Okay. And then data set containing class labels or target values. So as I mentioned, we had to uh, transform the labels into one hot encoding representation. So we're going to select that, which is uh, two categorical data, number six right here. And it is already pre-selected. Uh, we're going to select all columns. Uh, I think that's it. If we click here, we're going to start the training of the neural network on our training data set, which has 5,000 images of fruits and vegetables. So we're gonna train our model by training, by using this 5,000 data set 40 times. That's the epoch size. And we're gonna update the, the values of the weights, the filters, uh, after every 50 sample. That's the, uh, the batch size. So I click here. Uh, I'm going to pause the video, wait for these uh, three jobs to complete, and I'll be back shortly. Okay, so the training step uh, completed. The uh, training will generate uh, three files. Uh, one of them is the model or fitted estimator. The other one are the, the other one is the weights for the model, and the final one is the uh, the, uh, the accuracy of the model on the training data. So uh, we're gonna go to the tutorial now. And the next step would be model prediction. That's when 
Uh, we used a test data that we set aside and did not use for training. And we pass it to the train model. Uh, we want to know how well the train model does on the data not used in training it. So this is done via a tool called model prediction. Again, I know that this is all under uh, machine learning uh, header. Uh, so let's look for model prediction here on the left hand side. Here it is. So uh, choose a data set containing the pipeline or estimator object. That's object number 10, job number 10 here. That is uh, pre-populated correctly. Choose the data set containing weights for the estimator above. The weights are in uh, file or job number 11. Uh, we're trying to predict the input data type is tabular. And let's go to the tutorial. Uh, it's test X10 and we select all columns. So here I'm going to select test X10 from the drop down. And here I'm going to select all the columns. I think this looks good. Let's double check everything. Yep. So uh, I'm going to execute this. So what this does is that it uh, takes the images in the test uh, set, um, passes it to the model, and model makes a prediction. And then we need to compare the predicted output with the actual output layer. So um, okay, so the model prediction task completed. If you uh, view it, it should give you a bunch of labels that were predicted given the uh, test uh, data set as the input. Now we need to see how well did uh, our model uh, predict. And the way to evaluate it is uh, via uh, a confusion matrix. So the job that generates a confusion matrix is called machine learning visualization extension. And let's see if I can find it here on the left hand side. Uh, maybe it's on the uh, graph display data. Yes, it's here. So uh, let's go back to the tutorial. Uh, select a plot, select a plotting type confusion matrix for classes. We're going to select confusion matrix for classes here. Select data set containing true labels. That would be uh, test uh, Y10 that has the labels for the test data. Um, does the data set contain a header? Yes. So we're going to flip this uh, toggle switch. Uh, choose how to select data by columns. Uh, we only care about the label column. So we say select. Uh, columns by column head and name, and we care about the label. As you saw previously, the test X, Y, and I'm sorry, test Y10 and train Y10, train y they have three, lay, three columns, and we only care about the third column, which is an integer representation of the label. Let's go back to the tutorial. Um, so we select uh, for Select data set containing predicted labels. That's the output of our previous job, which is number 12. Uh, it does have a header. So we're ready to execute this. This is going to create a confusion matrix. So uh, let's go and discuss what a, a confusion matrix is worth while this job is running. This is a tutorial. Uh, so a confusion matrix is a table that describes the performance of a classification model. It lists a number of examples that were correctly classified by the model, true positives and true negatives. It also lists the number of examples that were classified as positive that were actually negative. These are called false positive or error type, type one error. And the number of examples that were classified as negative that were actually positive. These are false negatives error, or type two error. So given um, true positives, false positives, uh, true negatives, false negatives, we can calculate precision and recall. So these are the formulas for precision and recall. So um, 
precision of a fraction of predicted positive, positive that are actually positives. Uh, its formula is two positives divided by two positives, positive plus false positives. And recall is a fraction of true positives that were actually predicted. So recall formula is two positive divided by two positives plus false negatives. So we can calculate the precision and recall, uh, but sometimes it's easier to deal with one number that describes the performance of the, uh, our model. So what we can do is we can calculate the harmonic mean of precision and recall. These are ratios. So we can't just average them. We have to use a harmonic mean instead of arithmetic mean. And that harmonic mean of precision and recall, uh, it's called an F score. So we can calculate the F score for every digit uh, that, we, uh, that we classify. So this is a, a confusion matrix. Uh, the job is still running when it completes. I'll show you the uh, confusion matrix there. But this is the confusion matrix uh, that, I, uh, that was generated last time uh, or previous time I ran this. So uh, the rows are true class labels. So anything on the first row is the images that have class label of zero, which is 164 of them. Um, image uh, label zero represents a strawberry image, as we see, see here. Uh, label one is an apple uh, red delicious and so on. So there are 164 strawberries, 166 apples, and the columns are the predicted labels. So as you can see, uh, for label zero, we have 164 strawberries, and 164 of them were predicted to be strawberry. So our true positive rate is like basically one, 164 divided by 164. Uh, our false positive rate is zero and false negative rate is also zero. So we can calculate precision, recall, and F score. But uh, we don't have such a perfect uh, prediction for label three. Uh, let's see what label three stands for. So for label three, which is corn, um, we see that CNN has cor correctly predicted 118 as being a corn. So you can see uh, on the on this row, 118 were predicted as being corn correctly. 16 are false positives. They were predicted to be a corn, whereas they are label four. What is label four? Uh, it's a uh, sorry. And uh, well, let, let me, I'll get to that. And 32 of them, they were label three, but they were predicted as label four, five, six. So these are uh, false negatives. So we have the false positives, which is 16, two positive, which is 118, and false negative, which is 32. And given these three numbers, we can plug them into the precision recall and F score formula and calculate the F score for label three. So we calculated an F score for label zero, one, two, three, all the way to label nine. And then, you know, we get uh, uh, 10 F scores. Potentially we could calculate the harmonic mean of those 10 to just have one number. So, um, the uh, confusion matrix job just completed. I'm going to click here, and this is the result. It's slightly different than what we have in the uh, in the tutorial. That's because the uh, depending on the, the the training process, it's not deterministic. It's somewhat stochastic, so you may get slightly different results. But uh, it's the same thing. You know, you calculate like you can see right here. We have uh, one uh, false negative for label zero, whereas here we had none. So, uh, so going back to the tutorial, uh, the conclusion in this tutorial, we briefly describe convolutional neural networks and their application to image classification problems. We then use Galaxy ML's tool to solve an image classification problems using CNN and Fluid 360 dataset. So these are the references uh, uh, for this tutorial. 
uh, well, uh, thank you very much and uh, hope to see you in the next tutorials. Thank you.